This is Empowered Human Academy. Welcome home. I get new information that changes my mind. Okay. Then that's new information. Like the, I think one of the big lessons of, of stepping out of a rigid faith tradition is the um, devaluation of certainty. What's a better idea? Let's think about, you know, I don't know. This is about love. This is about light. This is about the idea that you, you have everything you will ever need. And this life of yours, this is where you grow, you expand, and you remember who you really are. I'm Abe. I'm Isaac. In Empowered Human Academy, we join with humans of all kinds to feel the inspiration that can only come with empowered living. The stories you hear today are unique, but the energy, the energy you hear today belongs to you too. So with hearts wide open, let's begin. Hey everyone, welcome back to Empowered Human Academy. Today we are joined with someone who we've been following uh, for a long time that actually sounds Ew, a little stalkers. bit creepy. Um, <laughs> but we, it's a friend of a friend and we've been following his writing and his work for a long time. And today um, we are chatting with him, Jedediah Jenkins. What is up? Hello. Hello, man. It is a delight to hang with you virtually. And in person, which I've also done, which was a dream. I'm happy that happened also. And again soon. And now in this moment, podcast wise, we begin as we always do with a question of identity, like core fucking identity. Wow. So not the way you introduce yourself to others. There might be overlap. Not when you're trying to strike an impression, not when you're networking, not when you're on LinkedIn. There may be overlap in all of those things. But when you come home to yourself and you're not presenting, what words of identity feel right? What words feel like home? Ah, <sighs> what words feel like home? Um, you know, okay. I wish I could just give you perfect words, but um, I have spent my entire adult life creating total 360 integrity with my identity in the sense mm. where I don't really change depending on the audience or even the audience of myself. Mm -hmm. I think because growing up gay in the South, I spent so much time code switching, as they say, that mm -hmm. I, the project of adulthood for me was to stop doing that. And so, so in a sense, I think coming home to myself is how I always feel. And, um, so yeah, I guess it's integrity. And then other things that come to mind are the like the feeling I'm always trying to get back to, which is that me time in the morning in a chair with a coffee and the New York Times or like whatever. And it's just like this, the, the air is cold in California in the morning and the window is open. And it's just me like warming up for the day. The day is before me. I could do all things. It's that is that feeling is how I want life to feel. Hmm. Hmm. Um, I, for those of you who are not watching via YouTube and are missing my wild gesticulation, um, <laughs> Jed, I think you and I have a couple things in common in this episode is not about me, but I do resonate super fucking hard on the like work to establish. I like the way you put it like 360 in integrity all around. Um, when did you realize, like, was it, was that a moment where you realized that was important or was that kind of like a, like a, like a, um, like an instinctual pull away from the mode of having to code switch all the time? Like, when did that, how did that become a priority? Well, it really became a priority because like I was in my late twenties and still had never been kissed and never kissed anyone. And I loved Jesus with my whole heart. But I, you know, I had come out of the closet at 18 or 19. It wasn't that I was lying about being gay. It's just that I was like waiting for God to heal me or mm. something. Give me a sign. Show me, show me. And I had just bottled up my sexuality and rejected it and pushed it away to the point where by the, my late 20s, I was like falling in love with all my straight best friends and going insane. Mm. Like mm. go truly going. It was ruining my life. And I kept waiting for. I kept waiting for God to like give me a sign and, and ultimately to a point where I like 
basically made a move on one of my straight friends and it was horrific. And I realized, wow, I am, I am not okay. Like mm-hmm. at all. Mm-hmm. And this is not going to go away. I can't wait upon the Lord. I think <laughs> like I need to figure this out or, you know, I'm going to lose it. And so it was really like, wow, I, I think by quote unquote, waiting for God to heal me or give me a sign, it's just bottling up these emotions that are going to come out sideways by like perverting my friendships, <laughs> like mangling my heart, all these things. And so it just really reached a breaking point. And I was like, I, I need to go on a date. Like I need to kiss a boy. And, <laughs> and you know what, if God doesn't like that, he can show me, you know, but clearly what's happening now. I mean, this is, I was so steeped in scripture back then, but it was this concept where Jesus says, you will know if a teaching is true by the fruit it bears, if it bears good fruit. And I was like, the fruit this is bearing is destroying my relationships and destroying my heart and like making me hate the faith that I grew up in. So like this cannot be the fruit that he's talking about, this kind of mm-hmm. celibacy, this kind of like rejection of my identity. And then the moment I started really accepting myself and moving towards full integration, the fruit began dropping from the trees, ripe and delicious. So, (laughs) (laughs) so yeah, it was, it was really my late twenties and that kind of, you know, it's interesting. I don't know what I think about astrology. Sometimes I think it's completely fake. Sometimes I think it's like so spot on that it's scary. And maybe that's the point that when you shoot a shotgun in every direction, sometimes you're going to hit the target. But, Mm. um, they say that like your Saturn returns season is between 27 and 33, where you transition out of what you were told to be into who you really are meant to be. And then it kind of ends at 33 in your Jesus year, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But it was right around 27 where this happened. And then by 33, I was fully myself and integrated in that with a new mystical expansive belief system and a bike trip and a book behind me. So that's, Mm -hmm. (laughs) I don't know. That's kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm curious about the, like what I'm hearing is a, um, like a discovery that t- to, to kind of put this in the words of like the empowerment theme that we talk about here. Um, it sounds like you came to a place where it was necessary to choose your own empowerment, lest things continue to get worse. Um, but it's interesting that that came with, um, like a, like a, a lifeline is probably too dramatic, but like you had, you had an idea from, your old belief system that gave you some leave, like, did it, did it feel like that in any way? Like, were you looking for some way to make this make sense with your old, old belief system or, or was it kind of a, if not a clean break, like, was it a 180? Like, okay, cool. I get, I just have to do my own thing here. No, I think that's a very great observation. It was, I was trying to fit in to the belief system that I was raised in mm-hmm. and I had tried my whole life to do that. Yeah. And so it was sort of like when, you know, if you're trying to perfect the project of America, you go to the Constitution, you just say, okay, liberty for all, justice for all. Okay, you're going to claim that. Well, Mm -hmm. then, if that's what you're going to claim, then we better work on that. You know, we better fix, you know, institutional racism. But, you know, like there's problems when when you have a creed and you say this and you don't live up to it. So Mm -hmm. I was using my faith tradition's own language against it. And I was like, you claim this, the words of your savior are this, mm-hmm. and yet you're producing this, that, that is not going to work. That is not working. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. There's a, I, I think this point might be like too, <laughs> almost, almost too simplistic. Um, but I, but I want to, I want to get clarity on it, even if it is super simplistic. Um, what made you, feel like you had the, uh, I kind of want to say, how dare you? Um, but the point is, the point is to say like, what, what gave you your own internal authority to say, um, like I get, I get to make this choice for myself. Um, Mm -hmm. and it, it might be as simple as like, well, I will die if I don't. And so not dying is better. Um, and this is why I say the question is very simple, but maybe, but I, but I want to know, like f- with, for, for your experience, like what gave you the authority or 
No, that's even that is a leading question. Um, walk me through the part where you began to feel like you could choose. Mm. It was a, it was, it wasn't a light switch. It was more like a sunrise, but it was, it was a combination of things. One, it was, and this is the power of, of a podcast and of, of reading. It's like, Sometimes a thought can wash across you and you hear it from someone else or, or, mm-hmm. and then it just reorganizes everything that's already in there. And mm-hmm. I remember having this thought that I, I was like, whoa, I actually don't fear God. I hmm. don't fear God being mad at me. I fear rejection from Christians, which was my whole mm-hmm. community. So it yeah. was, this was a really profound shift. I go, oh, I actually... I'm supposed to be afraid of God's judgment, but I actually know God made me and God loves me and God has to understand what I'm going through because he's omnipotent and created me. And every day of my life was written in a book before one of them came to be. And so it's like, which is a a Bible verse. Mm -hmm. And so like, how could he be angry when he made me this way? So actually I just fear people. (laughs) That that was a big, a a big shift. And then once I realized that, and then as I started to, to like find and develop a community of people who I knew loved me and understood the journey I was on and didn't expect me to, d- didn't see, interpret scripture or the Bible or even the world in the way that the, that the community I had come from did. Hmm. And so I knew that no matter which path I chose, I would be loved and accepted. I felt like I had community and mm-hmm. then I didn't fear God. And so I looked around and I was like, well, what's there to fear? Like, why <laughs> can't I do this? I got it all. And hmm. then and then on top of that, all that is happening in tandem to me falling in love with my straight best friends and being tortured <laughs> and like practically ruining those relationships. So I was like, you know, the, the thing is, there's there's some cheesy quote, which is like uh, life life will bother you or like something will bother you until you learn what you're supposed to learn or what, you know, Mm -hmm. it will keep, Mm -hmm. it won't go away. Mm -hmm. And I just very much believe that. We say that about truth. Like truth is bound to come out like at some point, whether it be through sickness or through life, it's going to come out or you die before it happens. But like, yeah, one way or the other, it's going to move. Um, so we try to be as straight up as possible because of that. We might as well be truthful because it's going to come out anyways. Um, I'm curious, you have a law um, degree, is mm-hmm. that correct? It's um, framed somewhere. I think it's in my childhood bedroom at home. And when I think of, you know, we've had some lawyers on here and I just love the way um, kind of lawyers' brains work. Um, I'm curious how your mind works with your ever evolving kind of like openness to the world. I feel like when people think of your writing, they look for it. Um, they look to it for inspiration or just insights about, you know, the world and, and, and different realities. Um, is there a relationship between how your brain works, like with the law being so like black and white to the openness that it seems like you have about like learning about different things and being open to having conversations with people who are different than you, um, and not being threatened by that as much as maybe some other folks. Well, I would say yes, and yes, and in the sense that the law isn't black and white. That's what you learn in law school. The law is always up for interpretation and argument. You can. I, I learned so much about everything when you realize, oh, even the boy, even when you sign, when you go skydiving and you sign an initial seventy-five pages of. Uh, if they murder, if they stab me through the heart on this plane, I have to say, thank you. You know, like no matter what Mm -hmm. you sign your life away, that's all negotiable that everything can be like reinterpreted by a judge, by a jury, like nothing is written in stone. Even the, I mean, the whole point of the Supreme court is that the constitution and the constitution can be interpreted different ways, like Mm. very different ways. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and the constitution was intentionally written in that way so that it could be like, it, it could morph and evolve with ever changing sentiments of the population. So 
in that sense, I think life and what it means is always up for interpretation and reimagining. And so that I don't know if the if law school taught me that or if it if it just exercised that muscle that I already had, but it definitely influenced the way that I that I I hope to make the argument for my perspective. And that's what I do through my writing is like, okay, like I see this happening in society. I see this happening in relationships. I see this happening in my life. What does that mean? And can I put that into language, which is a lawyer's job that can mm-hmm. convey that information to someone else? Mm-hmm. And and in that journey of, of observing and sharing your point of view, um, how do you stay grounded in your perspective when you have so much information coming at you that could potentially change it? Is it, is it, um, is it kind of, uh, does it make you uneasy? Does it make you, uh, excited? Um, because I feel like sometimes, um, when you have so much interpretation or there's so much interpretation for with everything, how does one stay grounded in their truth? Um, I don't know if I am grounded. I'm just, I'm just living. And I've, hmm. and if I get new information that changes my mind, okay, then that's new information. Like the, I think totally. one of the big lessons of, of stepping out of a rigid faith tradition is the um, devaluation of certainty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, okay, well, I believed this, like I, I, I'm believe in a liberal democracy, but if a really good argument comes up for another form of government, okay, well, I don't care. I just want mm-hmm. humans to thrive. So what's a better idea? Let's think about, you know, I don't know. Mm. Yeah, yeah, totally. Mm. Um, I'm glad you said that last bit because that was the bit that I want to talk about. Like, what is your litmus test for, uh, the viability of a perspective? Maybe like, how do you, how do you steer? Um, a lot of it has to do with, does it feel right? Does okay. it, mm-hmm. does it pan out logically? Mm. Cause I am, I'm a feeler, but I'm very much a thinker and like a systems thinker. I've, I am up in the sky looking at things from 30,000 feet. And so mm-hmm. if it, if it feels if it, yeah, if it feels untrue and it doesn't make sense, then I'm not going to do it. Hmm. You know, even if it's cute and everyone's doing it, like it's. Mm-hmm. I hear that. Yeah. Because we're talking about feelings here. This feels like a natural, like I, I feel pulled back to one of the things you said at the very beginning here. Um, you spend your day, I'm paraphrasing, um, tell me if I got, I've got this wrong. You spend your day working to get back the feeling that you have in the morning. And I have a couple of questions about this. Um, but just, just to, just to reestablish that context, um, can you describe the feeling that we're talking about and why that state is important to you? Well, a, I'm a morning person, so I feel good in the mornings. I love, um, being addicted to things. I love being addicted to, I love satiated addiction. So Mm. like, oh my God, (laughs) going to sleep, excited to wake up and drink coffee is just a whole vibe. I love Mm. it. I'm so happy for you. And I I also love being addicted to chapstick. Like I love needing things. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then I love needing harmless things that are totally delightful. Yeah. Um, I think I like a morning because it is, I'm an optimist too. So the morning is the promise, the promise of being productive, which I rarely am, or the promise of all kinds of things can happen in the day. Mm -hmm. So I think that moment kind of encapsulates the bright optimism with which I hope to live. Yeah. And the, the like, the me time of like valuing myself and valuing pouring into myself in the morning Mm -hmm. before I go forth and do anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like, start in that quiet moment with you 
with yourself. Even like, even when I'm dating someone or at someone's sleeping over at someone's house or whatever, I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to go over here and have my coffee and like read for an hour. It's for me now. And I just, I, 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 even if I'm in the room with someone else, I'm still alone. Mm -hmm. Or not alone is the right word. I'm just pouring into myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I get that. Um, Okay, for the question then. Um, as you as you go out into the day and discover different states, um, no, backing up, beginning again. Um, is the is the point to to oversimplify? Is the point of a day's experience to to oscillate? Like you you begin there, you go out into the world, you experience something else, you work to get back, and now you're you're kind of riding riding a wave between between these two. Um, is that part of the point, or would you rather remain? in that experience for the entire day or some third thing that I haven't thought of? Um, the, the point is the point of everything is to oscillate. There is like, mm. we're not supposed to ever be in one way because mm. like the human brain, the experience requires variation and stimulation. And so, mm. you know, it's like, it's so important to drink water, but if you drank water all day, you would drown. You know, mm-hmm. if you, it's so important to bathe, but you can't be in the shower. It's so important to work out, but you can't work like everything in its own time. Mm-hmm. And so I think that moment of charge and morning quiet and crisp air and me time is, is an important hour of my day, but then every other part of the day and every other part of life is also important. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I love the question of, um, like chosen adversity, which for me is implied a little bit by what you're saying. Like we get, we get to go out and set off on mm-hmm. other things. Um, and, and not, not adversity, like not to overly stress the, um, the duress side of that. Um, but I'm going to, for the moment, um, you've made a couple of, uh, like very public choices that have resulted in books and things, um, that are, um, um, there are at least diverse experiences. I'm, I'm talking here about like the, the Patagonia bike ride. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what goes into, and not, not talking specifically about that, that experience, that work, that project. Um, given that you now have a few years under your belt of making choices in and of yourself, like since the coming out um, process, now that you have some experience operating under your own authority, please correct my phrase at any point. Um, what goes into you deciding what you want to, oh boy. Okay. Here's the way I want to phrase it. And then maybe I'll fix it. What goes into you deciding what you want to suffer next? It's a little bit of an overloaded way to say it. Mm. Um, but knowing that you have access to like a lot of experiences that, you know, and a lot of experiences that feel like home and are safe and are comfortable, what goes into you deciding to leave home? Um, I think it has everything to do with a, I just want to experience life. I feel the finiteness of it. Mm-hmm. And so I want to taste, I want, I'm an Enneagram seven. Like I want to know what's on the other side of that mountain. I have to know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And to to an extent it's like i don't like have to know what meth is like but like <laughs> sure, there's sure. a lot of things that i have to know um and also you know w- when you are a creative it's it's kind of nice to figure out what is the thing that i bring like what is the mm. what is the purple cow what is the thing that that i'm doing here and i've kind of realized at least as i understand myself right now one of the things that I want to do as a writer is to live into things that people have always wondered and wanted to do Hmm. and I'll report back. So it's like the bike trip. It's like, what if you just, what if you just left your, left your job and bicycled to Patagonia and like went on a spirit quest? Like, what is that like? Cause people Mm -hmm. sit there in the job they hate or whatever it is. Like maybe Mm -hmm. they don't hate it. Maybe, they're a mother of four and they just can't leave the house because they're, they love their kids more than anything, but they just mm-hmm. totally can't. Okay. And so I'll, I'll do it and I'll tell you about it so that you can feel mm. like you did it. And so mm. 
I, my next book I'm working on is is about traveling with my mom in her mid seventies and asking her all the questions I never have and really getting to know her and going on a cruise with her and road tripping across America. Cause there's this feeling when you get my age and your parents get that age where you're like, wow, they're not immortal. And not only are they not immortal, they're very much just people who got older. Like they're not mm -hmm. parents are not something else. They're, they're actually just exactly like you, just older. And so I think a lot of people are like, wow, I, I wish I had spent more time or I wish I'd known my mom better or my parents better. Yeah. And so I'm going to do that and write about it, hopefully, and as an exercise to know myself more and know her more and, and cherish our time together, but also as a way to help families and children know their parents better and heal, yeah. you know, potentially broken relationships or fr or. So, yeah, so I, I, I want to step into like uncomfortable places um, or, or scary or exciting places mm -hmm. and report back and be like, you could do this too, or read this and realize I ain't doing that. Yeah. <laughs> yes, totally. <laughs> Thank you for doing that for me. Sometimes yeah. I think about like, like we ourselves are organisms, right? But also society is one. And so thinking mm -hmm. about the ways in which we like emerge to I mean, not serve society, but also kind of, and, and if part of, part of your role, um, with that model anyway, is to, is to like extend, extend the tentacle that is you and explore this, this nook and cranny of existence and, and report that sensory feedback back, back to the host. Where am I going with this? Um, I think that's very cool. Um, yeah. And things that I have thought about when you were talking about reporting back, like, I feel like I'm reporting back to my 13 year old self, like, mm. oh it's fine. Like, I, I mean, even yeah, the lifestyle that we have right now, like I would be terrified of even 10 years ago, five years ago. Um, so I, I love that. What, what's your, um, what's your relationship to your own optimism when it comes to doing things that are uncomfortable? How is, is, is your optimism kind of inherently there or has it been practiced, especially, um, with your experience being gay in the church? Hmm. I, I, I have, I am very optimistic, but I don't know if my optimism is actually a pattern recognition from living or if it's just my nature because Ooh. life has always been lovely to me. I mean, obviously I've had hardships growing up mm -hmm. gay in the church is not easy. Divorced parents, like all kind, you know, hello, but mm -hmm. you know, I've always felt loved by the sunshine and by the sunset and by my family and by even in I've always had friends I've, and I don't know why I, and I can't tell if feeling loved and feeling love has made me optimistic or by being optimistic it attracts positivity mm -hmm. and love I, I can't figure out the chicken or the egg but it's definitely a feedback loop because mm -hmm. I I feel very secure and loved by by life. And and so I walk with confidence towards scary things. And, you know, I've had my heart broken numerous times. I'm looking mm -hmm. for love and it's hard and it's scary and I have baggage, but I have a big smile on my face with every date I go on. I'm like, okay, our, yay, let's. I love this, you know? Mm -hmm. And so... I guess I, I guess all that to say I have a very friendly and loving relationship with my optimism. Hmm. Cheers. Um, there. Okay. So feedback loop that started way back when, who knows how, um, there are some things I think that we come in into life with as sort of like freebies. And there are things that are not that way at all. Mm. Um, are there, are there, are there, are there created feedback loops in, in your life? Like things that feel deeply a part of you now that are now um, inextricably tied with life experience that are just moving in their own feedback loop that weren't there before. Are there, are there new patterns like that, that you didn't have from birth? Well, I, I, I would say that I have moved away from fear of rejection which was my entire motivation, my youth and my whole childhood. Mm, it's like, okay, like don't, 
I think kind of it dawning on me that I was gay, maybe in middle school or younger, and realizing that something innate about me can get me in trouble. Mm -hmm. And so that's a very scary thing to realize. And so to, and then I'm like, okay, well, if I am always in this precarious situation where something that I can't control can get me in trouble, then I better figure out how to control every other variable. So I need Hmm. to be funny. I need to be likable. I need to be smart. I need to be student body president. I need to be whatever on, Mm -hmm. I need to make myself valuable so Mm -hmm. that if all, (laughs) if if this other thing becomes a liability, I have options. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of gay people experience that, that, and 100%. So, um, I've lost my train of thought. What was the question? Um, the question was about creating like oh, created feedback yes, loops. Yes, created feedback loops. So, so my fear of rejection. My, I've I've learned by moving away from that fear and into just three sixty five, or three sixty five and three sixty <laughs> integration. I like the implication that there's overlap in the circle. Continue. Yeah, 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 and every day of the year but like i've just i I have learned that that like that optimism mixed with knowing that i am whole and i don't need to fear this like looming everyone's gonna hate you everyone's gonna find something out about you and then it's gonna be over you know Mm -hmm. like i think about I, I lived like that. I lived in, oh my gosh, once my best friends know that I'm gay, I'm going to be alone. They're just going to mm-hmm. find this out. Like what a horrible way to live. And I, th- I think about, okay, that's not a real problem. That's a created problem and a created problem by a culture, right? That's not a real problem in the universe. Mm-hmm. Whereas there's things like, you know, when Harvey Weinstein iconically fell and he had all these skeletons in his closet and all of these burned bridges and enemies and broken people in his wake. And I'm thinking about these other powerful people who have done that their whole life. And then they they're going to sleep thinking like there are stories and articles that there, there are people that could take like, and I'm sitting here in this mansion and my whole life could collapse if this skeleton got revealed and there are many people living like that and going to sleep with the fear of the truth revealed Hmm. and i'm telling you i go to sleep every night like Hmm. there is nothing that does that nobody knows there's nothing Hmm. yeah and that Hmm. is an incredible feeling and by the way i have done some horrible things and and i have made huge mistakes but I, the the people that I have like wronged or have wronged me or whatever it is, there has been reconciliation there. There has been apology. There has been, the, you know, there, yeah. there are no, I, I just haven't, I, to my knowledge, I haven't left a wake of destruction, which is like, I, and so I sleep well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we talk a lot about leaving our like energy and kind of life plate really clean so we can, you know, do as much as we can and kind of live. And sleep well because we're not holding or hiding anything back. Mm. To my knowledge, I haven't left a wake of destruction. I want that on a throw pillow. That's I'm doing that <laughs> next. Right. Um, so, so is that is that then returning to the to the idea of the feedback loop? Because I'm curious, like, is that something that is self in like um, is that continually reinforcing itself now? Like the 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 integritous presence in the world does yes. that tighten itself up over time intrinsically? Yeah, I absolutely, I mean, I feel, and people have told me this, they're like, they're like, Jed, you're so confident. Or like, Jed, you just like walk into a room and you feel like you belong there. And I'm like, I do. I, I do feel like that. I don't, I am very, I, I spent so much time figuring out how to love myself completely hmm. that, hmm. that I now have all the, now that that's out of the way, I just love myself. Now I have all the time in the world to th- love other people and think about other people. So mm. when I step in, when I walk into a room, no matter who's in there, I'm not even wondering how I'm coming across. I'm not thinking about myself. I'm thinking about them. I'm like, oh my gosh, what are you into? What a, what a cool dress. What a, 
what did you do? You know, like I don't even think about, Oh God, they're looking at me weird or, Oh, they wish I didn't come. Or like, did I say Mm -hmm. something fun? I don't know. And maybe Mm -hmm. it's not that I'm not self-aware because I am, I don't put my foot in my mouth or something. Maybe Mm -hmm. I do. I just don't realize it, but, (laughs) but that's a, that's a feedback loop because because I have all the time in the world for others and I'm not worried about myself, then people feel heard and seen and, and loved. And so then they have all the time in the world for me. So it like, Mm -hmm. by, by not thinking about myself, I get a lot of blessing, which is interesting. Yeah. A, that sounds like freedom. B, self-love as a way to access the ability to pay attention to other people. That also yeah. sounds super intriguing. Well, because I feel like there are a lot of people who pay attention to other people to be loved first because they're, they're kind of yeah. compensating for their lack of self-love. W- what was your journey with your own self-love? Like, that's a million dollar question. Everyone wants to love themselves more. What was your journey with, you know, your own self-love journey? Your own, yeah. <sighs> I don't know. <laughs> Cool. I don't go on. I How did I learn to love myself? I I guess I guess when in my late 20s when I finally like broke down and was like I can't live for other people anymore. Hmm. I need to figure this out on my own. And at the time sort of what you were saying Isaac about figuring out how to find the authority within my own faith tradition to step away from it. Mm -hmm. There's another framing in Christianity called walking in faith. It's like you walk in faith that God will guide your steps. Right. And there was something there where when I was finally broken to the point where I couldn't sit still anymore, I couldn't sit in the ways of the world I was living And it dawned on me, oh, it says walk in faith. It doesn't say sit and wait for a sign. It says walk. Mm -hmm. It says go. And if you stumble and if you fall, get up and learn that lesson and walk. Walk in the faith that you know you're on a path. And if it's you're on the bad path, God will correct your course. And I think that is actually true no matter what you believe. Mm -hmm. You know, if you make mistakes, that is the universe telling you, don't do that. Don't touch the hot stove, dumbass. Like, Mm-hmm. Now you touched it, learn, like go over here, do something else. And totally. so that I think I spent so much time afraid of myself that the pendulum swing in the other direction was what if you just loved yourself? Hmm. Give that a try. Hmm. Give, like try that out for size. And and it worked. And And what's funny is I can be both at the same time. There are... I definitely love myself, but when I'm in romantic situations and someone loves me, there is a little bit, I still have the story of like, "Mm, I, there's something must be wrong with you if you like me this much, you know, like Mm -hmm. I know that I like myself, but like, I can't, there's no way I could be sexually attracted to someone. I still have Mm -hmm. stories, you know, Mm -hmm. around. And when, when is this, when are they going to find out that I'm not sexy or not cute or not lovable? Exactly. When, like, at what angle are they going to see me and then vomit or what, Mm -hmm. you know, and that's, I know they're, they're horny for me. They're like ripping my clothes off. Okay. But I still, am like, better dim the lights. What, you know what it is? It's just like stories. So that's, I, I don't, um, I I can both be obsessed with myself and know I belong in any room, but also be like, oh, so it's a combination. Hmm. I And what you were talking about, you know, the saying or the thought, like you can't live for other people. Um, and that kind of helped transformed your perspective into kind of self first, but then like led talking about systems in the cycle. Like now it's like, you don't really think about that to begin with, which then leads people to actually, to help people or love people in a way that they actually want to be kind of seen or experienced. Yeah. I, I, I think, I mean, humans, the, our brains de- developed to such an enormous size primarily f- because of the complexity of social interactions. Like we're social apes and you can read 80,000 expressions on someone's face with micro muscle shifts, you know, just the slightest little something. And you can read so much information from that. And 
I, I think that's part of the reason why people with autism, when, when their social abilities are diminished, their brain has so much space for other things. And that's why they can count hmm. to the two millionth digit of pi and like me- memorize the streets of New York from one glance, you know, like they mm-hmm. have all this space in their brain because of they, they're not reading somebody's emotions and faces. Right. Mm-hmm. And I, I've just spent so much time reading emotions and reading my own emotions and figuring that out that I just, I feel like that is there's, we all have this genius in us. And if you can just kind of like, well, what, what I'm saying is that when I am interested in someone else and I'm talking to them and they, they can feel their, their brain is so smart. They can tell if I'm talking to them because I just want them to like me. Mm-hmm. versus I actually mm-hmm. like them and I'm not thinking mm-hmm. about me and then they can receive that interest and they can receive my questions and my attention with an open hand. They can feel mm-hmm. that. And so then they feel safe and then they share more and then they, f- they yeah. like, okay, this guy doesn't want anything from me. Totally. There's more cognitive space to actually, and freedom to explore actually more than just survival, right? Cause then yeah. the threat, there's a threat there that you might not like each other, um, which takes up space. That's, Mm -hmm. that's really fascinating. This goes back to the, the feedback loop concept for me too. Like so much of our movement through, at least as far as I can tell, so much of our movement through the world is, um, subconsciously motivated or achieved, um, that the, like, like the, the project of, of one's own integrity, like walking through the world as yourself at all times, I feel like that's, like maybe the most useful thing you can do to be a functioning human, given that so much of ourselves is into conscious process, like to line up with everything below the surface Mm -hmm. and then be able to move forward, knowing that everything is operating in concert. Um, Yeah. It's I'm I'm reminded of something um, Abraham Hicks says, like the the better it gets, the better it gets and the worse it gets, the worse it gets. (laughs) And, and that suggests to me also sort of, um, like uh, quantum isn't the right word to use here at all. So uh, apologies to all of you who actually know what that means. The quantum leap from, from pointing in one direction to pointing in the other, or like reversing mm-hmm. polarities suddenly, like the decision that you spoke about to, well, what if I try loving myself? Like, I don't know that there are, well, and this, this leads to the question. Cause for me, I don't know if there are like, <laughs> there, there are, baby steps to be made. And there are ways that you can slice a process into, you know, smaller processes. But if I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing the leading question thing here again. Um, and I'm going to go for it. This is our podcast. You can do whatever you want. Yeah, for me, I, for me, I'm, I, I feel like I, there's a, there's a thread here that I want to pull on. I feel like there's a moment where like, there isn't a way to subdivide the process any further and you just have to decide to change. Mm-hmm. And I am I'm, I'm curious about I'm curious about all of that because I don't know how much of it can be explained. And the part of my brain that lights up thinking about this is the same part that lit up when you weren't sure how to explain how you arrived at self-love. Mm-hmm. Because I feel like there's a there's a gap here that I can't describe and I want your help. Can you describe this for me? <laughs> or how do you think about this? Uh, I well, there's a few things you said. One the concept of the quantum leap or the, the concept of subdividing something to the point like where you're at the atomic level, you're at the quantum level even, and you can't subdivide it anymore. That's how I felt with Christianity. I tried to mm. make it work so hard until it was, at, mm. I was at the bottom and I was like, yeah. this ain't it. This ain't it. I can't do it anymore. And that was mm. when I was like, I have to try something else. Mm-hmm. I have to, or I'm, I'm going to die. Cause I tried it all. I tried it for a decade yeah. in my adult life. And then on my whole childhood being raised that way. But anyway, um, there, there's a saying that uh, it's a, it's a famous saying, but it's the idea that if you, if you are on a boat and you turn the boat just two degrees, you know, when you leave the Harbor over time, you're going to end up in South Africa or England, you know, like, that slight change over time becomes a chasm. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when it, 
what what did you say when it's when it's good it's bet when it's the better it gets the better it gets the worse it gets the worse it yeah. gets so yeah so the 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 when you do that small shift and you go wow i i hmm. am pretty cool like my friends love me i'm pretty good at things or this thing or whatever it is and you just like start to believe that over time you really believe it and then then now that your brain isn't worried about that it can worry about something else and you keep just mm-hmm. like building mm-hmm. on top of things and then you start to just be like wow life is life is good hmm. and then the it's feedback like- loop of people feeling safe around you then you start to have mm-hmm. more friends then you start to mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. i feel like the better it gets the better it gets it's and like, the worse it gets, the more you hate yourself, the more you're like, why aren't people my friend? And then you're a Debbie Downer and then people try to be your friend and you're like, ugh, everyone hates me. And then eventually that person hates you. And then you're like, see, I told you. And you've already pre-decided. And so yeah. you like spiral into loneliness. Mm-hmm. Totally. Yeah. So to the does it does it then begin like that two degree shift with the with the mm-hmm. with the steering a boat metaphor? Mm-hmm. Um is it as simple then as just saying, I'm not going to devote further thought to analysis or subdivision of the process. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to change something small and then roll with whatever that is. I'm going to make a leap, even if it is two degrees only, mm-hmm. and then and then let it ride from there. Is, is that a fair description or would you put that differently? I mean, I, I think there's just so many different options. Different op- opportunities in life to make either a small shift or a, or a big leap. And sometimes a small thing feels like a big leap, Hmm, you know, like my big leap was just, um, I'm going to go on a date for the first time in my life. You know, like that's so normal. It was literally one neuron in my brain goes, yes. Yes. And it was an invisible yes that changed my life. Right. So like, Mm, totally. Yeah, we were t- we were talking about play and the invitation to play in our community group, and <clears throat> we talked about it can look, you know, as extreme as like skydiving or or dancing, um, mm. or it could be as that one little like I'm gonna just loosen my grip to my resistance to play, just like a mm. little little bit, mm. and all those are valid, and all those mm. move in the direction of compounding towards compounding effects towards you know having fun and um, playing more. Um, which makes me think of just like a general kind of, I want to know your thoughts on, um, and we don't have to talk about this for a long time. What are we compounding in terms like where, what's the direction that you feel like humanity is going right now? I mean, there's a lot of things compounding on top of one another, narratives, misinformation, all, all the things that is, are happening right now, in the U.S. culture at least. Where, where do you think humanity is going? Where are we compounding our uh, actions towards um i think we're in we are in a season of atomization meaning hyper particularity which you see the siphoning of like we don't have walter cronkite anymore you have your specific way of getting news i mean even the new york times the most important newspaper in the country is only read by like a few million people hmm. you know out hmm. of 300 and 50 million neat Mm -hmm. you know so like ain't nobody looking at the same thing except facebook or whatever and they're all and beyonce yeah (laughs) cultural constants thank you (laughs) yes thank you and so like you know and, and then you see that atomization happening all across the board like i think it's a sign of a healthy society when you are freaking out over um gendered bathrooms in North Carolina, Hmm. you know, like that Mm -hmm. is, that that is an important thing. And in, and in somebody in someone's life, that is Mm -hmm. very important to them. But at the same time, like you have to acknowledge that that is a very advanced society where you're not murdering each other in the streets with clubs. You're, you are screaming in a city hall meeting about, your fear of a trans woman in the girl's bathroom that you think is going to molest your daughter, which is like, what? This is what you're Mm -hmm. worried about? This, Mm -hmm. this is what you're screaming about. You Mm -hmm. clearly live in an advanced society. Hello. Mm -hmm. This Mm -hmm. is like, you are doing fine. If you've Mm -hmm. made up this fear in your 
in mind. Hmm. Hmm. And so like, I think hopefully that will continue to happen. <laughs> Meaning like we become more and more expressive New in our idiosyncrasies that make us. And then the more that, that, we just feel safer and safer to be more and more unique. That said, I mean, there is a concept, you know, that there, there, there is a, a worry that that can become, that can go too far where you become hypersensitive to all micro microaggressions and you don't feel safe in the world when somebody, you know, if someone says, hi, you look beautiful. Then you're like, don't sexualize me. And then it's like, you're freaking out and you're crying in the corner. Like, I don't know if that's real, but I'm just saying that like there is a world where we can become so sensitive to the differences and we actually forget our common humanity. We actually mm -hmm. forget that the project of diversity is to get along. <laughs> mm. And and so mm. I, I actually don't know where we're going. I, I am a completely agnostic about the survival of the human species and I don't really care if we survive. Mm. Um, I think if we kill ourselves, We've only been around for 200,000 years. The dinosaurs got 350 million years and we're like, oh, sad they died. And we like, we show up and we blast ourselves off this planet in 250,000 years. That's pretty, that's iconic. You know, like that's <laughs> incredible. I love that. Um, and so I was, hopefully we live, but maybe we won't. Totally. <laughs> At least we're having fun along the way. I, I was yeah. reminded of a meme I just saw. It was like, you went outside without sunscreen. You hate your skin. You ate meat. You hate, you hate the planet. Like everything is going to yeah. be kind of criticized at some point. So yeah. Yeah. And maybe that's good. I mean, hypersensitivity is, you know, pain is a signal to the body that something should change, you know, but then mm -hmm. there is also things like nerve damage where your brain, you know, my, one of my best friends, Ruthie has nerve damage in her spine where her body is perfectly healthy and fine. And it's telling her she's on fire, right? So that's, mm -hmm. it's nerve damage that is a evolved and important part of our body. That's just gone haywire. And it's like driving her it's, and then she's had to do all this work of healing that misinformation to her own body. So I don't know at one point, at what point in society where pain is a legitimate warning sign of a real problem versus nerve damage. I don't know. Mm. Hmm. Hmm. Makes sense. Um, this is not a subject I'm going to dig into here, mm. but the, the freight, like healing misinformation, that sounds like that to me invites a very interesting conversation that I'm not going to dig into at all right now. I'm just going to name it. Mm -hmm. um, a while back in this conversation, um, you, I forget what we were talking about at the time, but you said something like, that's not a real problem in the universe. That's a societal construct. Mm -hmm. um, are there any real problems in the universe? <laughs> I would say like a real problem is like climate change. That is mm, something okay. that is like, I don't care what you believe, you know, like, for example, like sex before marriage or something like, or a religious mm -hmm. belief around don't use the Lord's name in vain. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That is a constructed problem. The universe rocks, you know, the river doesn't know what that is and doesn't care mm -hmm. and thinks it's hilarious that you care. Right. <laughs> and yeah. whereas like, the oceans heating up two degrees Celsius and boiling fish and like killing everything. That's a real thing that no matter what social construct you believe, it doesn't matter. That's an asteroid hurtling towards the planet is a real problem yeah, because yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. nothing about human culture can change that. Yeah. So, and this is an interesting place to, to drive towards closure. And I'm curious to see where we go with this um, armed with, like malleable perspective, but also like a place to anchor as we strive for our own integrity. Um, does that, what question do I want to ask here? I kind of want to ask like, does, does that matter? Like if there are constant, if there are problems, scenarios, situations, facts that are, that are constant out there, um, like in observation of the oceans doing this thing, like there, there are things that are happening um, and then there's us and there are things that are happening inside of ourselves and we strive towards integrity with, with those things, with, with whatever we are. 
Um, but we're all like, we're also like piloting these perspectives around two, mm-hmm. two degrees at a time. And then we're letting these things ride. What do we, what do you, okay, here's, here's the question. I'm going to go super wide with it. What do we do with all that? Well, I feel like it's important to get to the root of the why of the why of what mm-hmm. you're doing on this planet in this life. And it's to what is the point of society? What is the point of living? And I think it's to, I think it's to thrive, not to quote the slogan of Kaiser Permanente, but it's to thrive. And so mm. like thrive as a species. And, and I love the, I love the concept of thrive because that word has, it brings with it this, like in my mind, this like lush ecosystem, this, mm-hmm. this like collective um, concert orchestra of everything around mm. you is also thriving as opposed mm-hmm. to just be happy, which can be a very solo thing. Sure. You know? Mm. And so, and, go ahead. Yeah. So, that, so when you're wondering, okay, is, is this problem in my life constructed or real? Is it societal or is it tangible? Am I making up a problem in my life by thinking everyone hates me or do they actually hate me? You know what, what it, it's like, I think when you're moving through life, what to get involved in, what to start, what to end, you think, is this moving society myself towards thriving or away from it? And I think that's kind of a helpful framing of everything. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And because the word thrive in, in includes to me, at least like the, the ongoing expansion thriving, mm-hmm. it's kind of like consistent versus happy. It's just like, when are you happy? You're happy once this is an alive thrive thriving, um, kind of includes this aliveness that is really mm-hmm. powerful. And it feels longer thriving yep. Im- implies an expanse of time rather than I'm happy today right now. Totally. Mm-hmm. Totally. I love that. I'm feeling that. the specific kind of joy that leaves me like doing a tiny dance in my seat. So <laughs> thank That's you. Cause you're thriving. Uh, so, yeah, thank you Hell for yeah. being a part of that. Um, as, as we close, we do so with two questions. And the first question is what does an empowered Jedi Jenkins look like and feel like? Um, he is, <sighs> what is empowered? Jedi? Mm, he's very smiley. He is. <laughs> I don't know. I feel pretty empowered in my Hell life. Yeah. So, so what what do I look and feel like? I look like, you know, I've got some new thrift store clothes that I feel sexy in, or I never feel that sexy, but just cool. Um, I feel excited to see and celebrate the people around me, and. I probably have like a delicious mezcal cocktail in my hand hmm. and <laughs> life is good. Hmm. I'm just happy to be here. Hmm. Yeah. I want that. I want that sexy drink thrift store clothes mm-hmm. hanging out again. Can't wait. Yeah. In, um, in December. Finally. And for the final question, um, what do you know for sure? I know for sure that <laughs> it's 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 interesting because this kind of ties back to what we spoke about earlier which is I don't know much for sure because certainty is boring mm-hmm. and has only gotten me in trouble and so I guess I know that for sure. <laughs> wow. That absolutely counts. Jed, thank you so much for your time. Um, for our listeners who are listening, check out, um, he has two books out, um, New York Times bestselling author and a, just a fucking rad human. Um, <laughs> we're so grateful for your time and your presence and your energy. Thank you so much. Um, we could do, I could do this for hours. We're like running out of time, but um, <laughs> we love you. Thank you so much. I love you. Isaac, too. do you have I anything? I can't wait to see you again. Yeah. Cheers, dude. Thank you for your time. Um, everyone listening, love you dearly. Have a good day.
This podcast is the work of Lightword, our company, named for that toward the light direction which informs every single thing that we do, including money. Which means, like everything else, the way we earn revenue is not based on industry norms. It's based on what feels deeply right and aligned by passing through the door that feels like it has more behind it, not less. And the way we keep this podcast going is all Lightword. It's pay what feels good. It's an exchange of value between you and us. We're keeping conventional podcast advertising totally out of this. And here's how pay what feels good works. We give you this episode because it feels good to do so. And you consider, honestly, what number of dollars this episode is genuinely worth to you. I do not care if that's $3, $1,000, or literally $0 and a heart emoji, as long as that trade genuinely makes your day better. And the energy there is the entire point. That is what we're building our business on. No advertisers, no selling your attention, just you and us, trading value in a way that builds us both up. So whatever the number, when you're done listening, head to empoweredhumanacademy.com and hit the pay what feels good button. We use this policy across all of our company's work and I'm really excited to bring it here to the world of podcasts. This is us voting for the world we wanna see. Thank you for being here.